So we're back in Daniel 11. Uh, we had to split this up because of how much historical detail is in the fulfillment of the prophecy that was given here in this text around the year 534. And so we spent a ton of time last time going through a very tedious historical background, and we're going to finish that off today. We don't have nearly as much history to go through today because we're actually going to make a transition uh, around verse uh, 36 today where we're suddenly going to make a big leap past our own time into the future, I'm going to argue, although we are going to talk a little bit about what the argumentation would be to the fact that probably a lot of this has already happened. I disagree, but um, in fact, I shouldn't call it a fact because I disagree. Um, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So uh, that's kind of where we're at. We'll do a little review here in just a little bit, but before we do that, let's uh, pray before we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the faithfulness of your servant Daniel. And we pray that you would grant us mercy and grace as we come before your word. And that we as a people, filled by your spirit, would be able to have wisdom and insight in the understanding of your word today. Father, I pray especially that you would fill my heart with your spirit that I might speak um, from the fullness of you and not from the vain arrogance of knowledge. Bless this time that we might grow in the likeness of Christ and go out into our communities and the nations to make you known and bring you glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so just a quick review. Remember in chapter 10, uh, Daniel is down by the river, and this being comes to him that we find out is the Son of Man. It's a, essentially, I, I don't even like to say it because it kind of takes away from a bit of the mystery of Daniel 10, but it's basically pre-incarnate Jesus coming to meet with him, the Son of Man, the Son of God that's coming to meet with him. And Daniel's concerned, clearly concerned, because... He's, he's been shown all these nations that would come to pass, all these different things, all these different uh, beasts and these different phases of the statue that he saw earlier in the book of Daniel. There's supposed to be all these nations that are going to come to pass and ultimately toward the restoration of Israel. But the problem is he's only seen the transition of the first to the second, and he will not see the transition of the second to the third because he's soon to die. Uh, Daniel doesn't live much longer. Bear in mind, he saw the, the very first beginnings of the exile back in 605, and now we're at 534. He's very, very old. He's not going to live much longer. He hasn't been working in the administration of the king for about two years now. He's just out enjoying retirement, I guess. Um, whatever retirement looks like for a 90-plus-year-old Jew in the middle of captivity, not captivity, sort of. Um, but he's down by the river. And the Son of Man comes to him to give him reassurance that the plan is still in motion. That even though it looks like things have stalled out, because seemingly we've made a transition from one kingdom to the next, and everything just kind of stopped. But we're going to find out that that's not actually the case. And we've already seen prophetic uh, scripture from chapter 11 that shows us that this plan is going to continue to move forward. And there is going to be a transition from the second kingdom into the third kingdom in this process. And so that's where we're at right now in this third kingdom. So just to give you a little bit more of this timeline, because I, I really believe repetition is helpful with learning. So 539, Cyrus II comes in to Babylon, conquers it, and then he builds a palace there for Cyaxares II, the Median king at this time, to come and live in. He comes and lives there for about two years, and then he dies. At that point, Cyrus takes over the kingdom, and now it's a full-blown Persian kingdom because Cyrus is a Persian, not a Median. Okay? Cyrus rules for about another seven years, and then he decides to go on a rampage up in the steppes of Russia, a Caucasus area, and he ends up getting killed while he's out there. Um, made some bad choices. Very interesting story if you'd like to read in Herodotus Joe. So, very good story. Um, yeah, write that down, Joe. <laughs> Joe's the person that when you mention an ancient text, he actually goes out and gets it and reads it. Um, that one will keep you busy for a while. So, um, But Herodotus details what happens with Cyrus um, at his death. But then we get a little bit into the administration of Cyrus about 534. This is when Daniel received this vision starting in Daniel chapter 10, 1 through 21. And then when we get into chapter 11, we actually start getting this unfolding prophetic utterance from this uh, being the son of man that has come to Daniel in order to reassure him that the plan is still in motion. God is still working toward the restoration of Israel and the reconciling of all that's happened. So here's our plot of Daniel. Just to lead you through it again. 
So we started over with the exile. They're all being let off. Chapter 1, we went through the preparation of the men to serve the king. Then we go into this sort of parallel structure here. Where chapter 2 relates about the statue, but also it relates to chapter 7. It connects over. Uh, remember when we talked about chiasms? We have level A, level A, B, C, and then D in the middle. Okay? Same sort of thing here. It's a very Jewish way of writing whenever I want to write about something. What that means is whatever the central concept is is the most important concept in the middle of my flow. It's hard for us as Westerners because we want to see a logical progression from A to B to C to D to, and it just keep going. In a Jewish mindset, what it does is it centralizes the focus in between the two. So chapter 2 and 7 parallel each other because the four, the four or five-ish kingdoms that are mentioned in the king's dream of the statue here is paralleled to the beasts that Daniel sees in chapter 7. Then chapter 3, we get, I'm sorry, my eyesight is shot, the furnace. And then over here we get the lion's den with Daniel. We had two trials based on obedience to the king in Babylon or the king of creation. Then we get Nebuchadnezzar being kicked out into the field as a beast. And then we get Belshazzar's pride, the pride of two different kings in Babylon. In the middle, it's all about being humbled before the Lord. And that's the primary concept, to humble ourselves before the Lord. Then we move out of this into chapter 8 where we talked about the ram that is Persia that was going to transition into the goat of Greece, basically. And then this little horn who is, or I shouldn't say little horn, the big horn that comes up on the goat at first is who? Alexander the Great, good. And then when that horn is broken, four other horns pop up. Now I'll give you bonus points if you can tell me the four horns that pop up after him. Four generals, good. Who are they? I'll give you the I'll give you the I'll give you the hard one. Cassander, Ptolemy was one of them. Okay. Ly Lysimachus, not as important if to biblical story because he's over in what's called Thrace, kind of that area between Asia and, and yeah, Cassander, who is taken over in Greece, and then Seleucid, yeah, uh, Seleucus, Seleucid kingdom, yeah, yeah. Good. And Seleucus actually becomes our focus because the king that's going to cause the most amount of problems for Israel in the end is a Seleucid king. Uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. All right, so we're in this section right here into this flow. Now, as we move in further, we go through the Daniel 70 years prophecy, but we're going to focus in here on 10 through 12. So we had 10 where he was being reassured that Persia would transition into Greece, and then all of a sudden these kings would come along. This is where we've been right here in this chapter 11, where all these minor kings are coming along. Who are the Seleucids and the Ptolemies that come along? Amber, did you have a question? Oh, Anna, Anna, yes. So when we're talking about how they're kind of, the early chapters kind of parallel each other. Mm -hmm. So all these ones on the end, is that still parallel from, is it what, chapter 3? Uh, no, but the chiasm's already stopped. Okay, so this is, when you move into 8, it's transitioned out of that and moving forward. So, And chiasms can literally, I'll, I'll see you, Melissa, I'll be in just a second. Chiasms can be as big as the entire book of Isaiah, which it is. The entire book of Isaiah is one big chiasm, which, by the way, is really important for arguing that there's only been one author for Isaiah because a lot of modern scholars like to suggest there's three different Isaiahs, and there's not because it's one big chiasm. But just big argument. Huh? Right. Well, yeah, because it can. No, 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 exactly, exactly. So you can have chiasms that are huge, and you can have them that are tiny. In fact, uh, there's a pro proverb. 3, 11, and 12, I think, just those little verses is one chiasm. And it drives your focus toward the central idea within the two lines. Because, you know, in Hebrew poetry, it's I say one thing, then in the next line I say the same thing. In that weird verse setup, what they do is he says one thing, then he says the same thing, but he says it backwards. So that the central concept gets highlighted in that short little itty-bitty chiasm. So the problem with chiasms is when they were discovered, all the scholars wanted to see them everywhere. So sometimes it's a stretch. Other times it's clearly there. Daniel, it's clearly there in kind of a macro structure. But it can be micro structure, sentences, whatever it is. It's just a very common concept. So we are here. We're in the middle of this right here. And we're going to go all the way down to here with a dead king. I Melissa. Was just ask again mm -hmm. where you got those. What were they? Oh, yeah. It's called the Bible Project. Bible Project. Uh -huh. That's what it was. Okay. Yeah. Very helpful. Um, but this is where we're at today, okay? Yeah if, you, yeah, if you just Google it, you can do it on YouTube as well. But this will give us our whole thing. And then that's pretty much it. Now, uh, Jeremy will be doing Chapter 12, Lord willing, next week. 
uh, and that will show you what, I, what I'm basically dealing with in 10 and 11 is we're in the midst of all the chaos of history. What Jeremy's going to get into in chapter 12 is how is the Lord going to bring all that chaos into order? Because as you remember, in Genesis chapter 1, God is concerned with doing three things. And what are those three things? Micah? No, that's the problem. What's the three things that he's going to do? He brings light, life, order. There you go. So light, life, and order. This is the three things that God brings to creation in order to resolve. Right now we're in the midst of chaos, death, and darkness. And through this, when we get to chapter 12, we're going to see how he restores light, life, and order to creation as he restores Israel in, in tow. So, But of course, I get to deal with all the chaos. So, oh, chapter 11, 29 through 45. Everybody ready? Here we go. All right, we're going to back up a little bit. All right, so I just want to give you a little bit of history because what we did last week was we kind of we were on a global scale. Now we're going to zoom into like Jerusalem and Antiochus' dealings with Jerusalem. So I have to back up just a little bit so you've got a little bit of context. So in 185, uh, it, the, the temple's been built for many, many years. It was reconstructed and dedicated in 516, um, which is still ahead of Daniel's time. Um, but in terms of the time period that these guys were in, it's way back when. So the temple's been in service for many years. In 185, a guy named Onias uh, III becomes a, the high priest. Now... The problem is, he's got a brother. And his brother, Jason, um, is going to become a problem here in a little bit. But I'm going to read off of this because I had to write this down in order just to make sure that I didn't get this wrong because it's so convoluted. So there's a guy named Menelaus, who's not a Greek, by the way, although that is a very Greek name, and that's going to become very important in a little bit. But a guy named Menelaus, he's a Benjamite. Uh, he doesn't like Onias III because Onias III is very staunchly Jewish. Okay, So here's a Polaroid of Onias III. But back, remember back then you have to shake it real slow. Okay? Um, so Anias III is very Jewish. He's all about following the Mosaic Law, but Menelaus isn't. He's a Hellenist. Um, by the way, the, the Greek word for Greek is Helene. Okay? So when you hear the term Hellenist, it means someone who wants to Greek eyes. Okay? So there's a group of Jews in Jerusalem that want to be very Greek because the Greeks are in control and they like Greek culture. For obvious reasons, because they can do whatever they want and not be accountable to God. But Ananias doesn't. He wants to obey God as high priest. Well, Menelaus doesn't like him. Well, all of a sudden, while Onias is high priest, Menelaus goes to the Seleucid king, who at this time is not Antiochus Epiphanes, Seleucid, uh, Seleucus IV, who was right before him, and says, Hey, you'll never believe this. There's all sorts of treasure in the temple. You want to come see? You want to come have some of it? Come on, come on, come on. So Seleucus comes over and he takes some of it. Well, who gets the blame? the guy who's in charge, Ananias III. So then all the Jews are mad at Ananias because he let them into the temple to take the treasure. So now he's unpopular because some underling, some nobody named Menelaus, let the Greeks in. So, about this time, Jason, who is the brother of Ananias, pays Antiochus in about 175 to become high priest and kick his brother out. So Antiochus removes Ananias from the high priesthood and puts his brother Jason in his place. Way to be, bro. So, that happens in 175. Now the problem is that once this has happened once, it can happen again. So Menelaus gets an idea. If Jason can pay Antiochus off to bump his brother out of that office, then surely I could pay him to get rid of that guy. I'm not even related. So he does exactly that. So in 171, Menelaus pays off Antiochus and believe me, Antiochus is happy to take bribes. He has no problem taking money and kicking Jews around. No problem with that whatsoever. So he does. In 171, he puts Menelaus in power. Now bear in mind, now you have a Hellenistic Jew who is the high priest. See the problem? Okay. This is going to get worse and worse and worse. So what happens is, Onias comes in and starts protesting. He says, look, what are you doing? You can't put a Hellenistic Jew as the high priest. And keeps, well, of course, Antiochus doesn't like this at all. And through various circumstances, Onias ends up getting assassinated. I thought this was better than the skull. It took a little time, but I thought it was effective. So Onias actually gets assassinated. Okay, Which leaves, then, of course, Menelaus still in power. 
So we're in 168. This is the same year that uh, Antiochus tried to pull some stunts in, in terms of moving into Egypt, etc. But this is what all has been going on behind the scenes at this point. Uh, at this point, Jason attempts a coup to th overthrow Antiochus and uh, Menelaus in Jerusalem. However, it fails. And in the process, Antiochus sends a bunch of troops into Jerusalem and kills 80,000 men and carries off the women and children into slavery. Um, he's no friend to the Jews, let me assure you. So when we get into ch verse 29, this is where we're at. Make it? Make sense? Good? Okay. So about this time, we get to verse 29. So let's start in verse 29, and then we will start rolling forward. Oh, we're on the next page. So at the appointed time, he will return and come into the south. Remember, the south is where? South. Egypt. Because it is south. Very good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he goes where? Egypt. Okay, good. So he's going, he's invading from, because he's in control of what we call the Levant, this Judean area. Um, please don't call it Palestine. The Romans called it Palestine as an insult to the Jews because Palestine is the Latin word for what? Philistine. No. It's the Roman word for Philistine. Yeah. Say that again. Palestine is the Latin word for Philistine. So it's the land of the Philistines. They did it as an insult to the Jews. So that's why I absolutely despise when scholars call it Palestine, because I'm like, dude, I mean, call it Levant, at least. Levant's a really old geographic term uh, for this whole area. You can't really call it Judea, because Judea is only like a segment that's down here, but this whole area is called the Levant. So just a heads up. It's a little annoying. Um, but anyway, at this time, Antiochus says, hey, I got a great idea. I'm going to go whoop up on Ptolemies again, and while I'm at it, I'm going to send a fleet to Cyprus. And in fact, it says that right there. It says, uh, for ships of Kittim. Kittim is Cyprus in Hebrew. Okay. So he sends these ships to Cyprus, etc. So he says, I'm going I'm to take them out. Well, who, who had a problem with his westward expansion last time? Or at least the Seleucids' western expansion. Yeah, Rome. So uh, just to give you an idea of what the world looks like at this time, here are the Seleucids. They've kind of made their way over into Asia Minor. Here's modern-day Turkey. Uh, the, the Egyptians control these two. And then, of course, here you have Rome. Now, you can see Rome is starting to make progress to the west, or east, I'm sorry. And so this is going to be a problem because Antiochus is going to cause a situation to erupt that's going to allow Rome to get a foothold into Asia Minor, which is going to allow them to expand further to the east and eventually control Judea and the Levant as well. So Rome gets involved once he invades. And they say, no, you're, you're going to back off now. Because why is Rome concerned with Egypt being attacked? It's their grain source. Okay, It's their food. Because Rome has expanded. They don't have nearly enough land to supply food for their population. This has been a problem for Rome for at least 300, 400 years. Their population just is too big. and There's not enough farmland in Italy to be able to support the amount of people. So they have to outsource their grain supplies. So as we read in uh, verse 29, at the appointed time he will return and come into the south, but this last time it will not turn out the way it did before. He made a little more progress before when he tried this invasion tactics, not this time. For ships of Kittim will come against him. The Romans send ships from Cyprus to attack him and uh, to come against him. Therefore he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. And we'll stop right there because that starts moving ahead a little too far. So this is a really great story. Are you ready for this? I love this story. So Rome sends this old man, Gaius Popilius Linus, to go meet with Antiochus. Well, i got to confess. Well, actually, I don't know if you know this, but all these old statues that you see, they look like they just go wired over eyes. These statues used to be painted. So they wouldn't carve the actual iris into the eyeballs. They would actually paint them in. And just over time, the paint is worn off. And so that's why they look like that. Um, by the way, this is not actually Popilius in the image. I just picked some old Roman. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, so, but, but he was. He was elderly, and he comes to Antiochus, and I love this story. He says to Antiochus, look, you need to withdraw, and if you don't withdraw, consider yourself at war with Rome. He knows he can't fight Rome. Nobody can at this point. Rome has seen too much military success. They will destroy him. 
So he says, well, let me go back and uh, meet with my counselors. So Popelius gets a stick out, and he walks around Antiochus and draws a circle in the sand. He says, you step out of the circle without making a decision to withdraw, you can consider yourself at war with Rome. And he says, fine, I'm gone. And he decides to, because he knows he can't go to Rome, war with Rome. There's just nothing he can do. And so he decides to back off, and he walks out, and says, everything's okay. I just think it's funny this old man just schooled him. It was amazing, because this guy is horrible. Absolutely, he's the worst. And this little old man from Rome comes marching in, draws a circle around him, and the problem solved. <clears throat> so what happens is he goes back to his own land, and he begins to take out his frustration on the Jews. But this also allows Rome to get a foothold to begin their eastern expansion as well later on. So when we get into verse 30, Therefore he will become disheartened and will return, become enraged at the Holy Covenant, and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Now what that means is, what he's going to do is he's going to show favor toward Menelaus and those who are Hellenists because they have the Greek agenda in mind. So that's what he says when he says he will show regard for those who... What does it say? Uh, so he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. These guys are forsaking the Holy Covenant. They're Hellenists. They want to be Greek. And so he shows regard for them and their agenda. Okay? And that's what we get at the end of verse 30. Everybody tracking? Cool. All right. And then he also begins to put his thumb down on the other Jews. Okay? He doesn't like the conservative Jews. Uh, he wants these Hellenists to, to succeed. And the Hellenist party gets more and more power. But all these conservative Jews, he starts putting the thumb down on them. Okay. All right. So go too far ahead. Okay. So I want to explain this real quick. We have a culture clash going on here. Big culture clash. And this does not stop at all, all the way through the time of Jesus, all the way through the time of Acts. You'll always hear about the party of the Hellenists in the Gospels, in the book of Acts. These people who have an agenda to turn the Judean Jewish people Greek. Okay. Yes. Uh, Kabbalah. Yeah. yeah uh, the Kabbalah is missed. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I would actually say that's later and more out of rabbinic Judaism. Um, what happens when the temple falls in 70 AD? The Jews basically have to reinvent their religion because now there's no temple. So what do we do about sacrifices? Oh well, the sacrifices are the ones you make with your heart. Um, which, if you're going to be a faithful Jew, that's just not sufficient. And so they have to kind of reinvent. And eventually out of that comes rabbinic Judaism. And I think out of, I, and that's a little out of my expertise, but I would imagine that's more where that comes out of. But you get this clash of cultures. And the Greeks tend to win just because they're the ones who are in power. Um, but there are always these faithful Jews, this kind of remnant, if you will, that's always kind of there in the background. Um, and we're going to mention those a little bit later because uh, that's going to become a problem. And they're going to actually rise up against the Greeks here pretty quick. So in 167, uh, we get what we have stated in verse 31. This is the big one, okay? Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. Actually, what the Hebrew says is the desolating abomination is technically what the phrase is. What happens is, uh, at one point, Antiochus sends 22,000 soldiers into Jerusalem. The objective was to stop the Judaistic practice and Hellenize. So what does he have his general do? Offer a pig on the altar in the temple. That's the desolating abomination. Now what happens when you offer a sacrifice of a pig on the altar in the temple? You defile it. So the next day when the Jews show up to give sacrifices, what happens? They can't. And that's why in verse 31 it says, and to do away with regular sacrifice. Or in the Hebrew it says, do away with the regulars, if you will. Uh, the normal, everyday, the I'm sorry, the continual. That's what it says, the continual sacrifices. that are offered day after day after day. They're supposed to offer a lamb in the morning and a lamb in the late afternoon every day. And now they can't do it. Because he's offered a pig on the altar. And this happens in 167. In the temple, yeah. Well, it's the only place you can offer sacrifice now. Because at this point, God has made his name to rest there. And so in, the point, in this point of salvation history, that's the only place you can offer a sacrifice. But they can't now. They can, but the problem is in order to do that, certain circumstances have to be in play, and he's not allowing that to happen. 
He's not giving them the freedom to be able to rededicate and purify that temple because he doesn't want them to. Right. He wants to Hellenize. Yeah. So is that just one lamb in the morning and evening that the priest does? Except on the Sabbath. Then you've got two in the morning and two in the afternoon. It's yes. It's, one, it all no, no, no. Not for everybody. It's just the one. Yeah. Now there are other. Uh, right. Leviticus is fantastic. <laughs> it's got a lot of sacrifices. Um, but yeah, daily, there's, there's an extra one on Sabbath in the morning and the evening. Um, and then new moons and, you know, and what it depends. But generally speaking, every day there's at least one lamb in the morning, one in the evening. So he stops that from happening because he's defiled it. And he continues to push this agenda of the Hellenists. Um, in verse 32 we read, uh, By smooth words he will turn the godlessness, turn to godlessness those who act wickedly toward the covenant, but the people who know their God will display strength and take action. So he continues to manipulate these Hellenistic Jews toward his end. They get benefits too, but he can continue to manipulate them for his end of Hellenizing the Jews. Okay? Now you'll also notice at the end of 32 it says, But the people who know their God will display strength and take action. Well, about this time, a guy named Mattathias uh, comes along, and he starts making this push for return to conservative Judaism. He's a Levite. He's a priest. He's not a high priest. He's just one of the priests. And he makes a big push for conservative Judaism. And this whole new group develops out of that called the Hasidim, the godly ones, okay, the righteous ones, if you will. Uh, the obedient ones who actually follow the law. Uh, we still have these people around today. They're called Hasidic Jews. Okay, This is where the term comes from. Um, and by the way, this is the group out of which the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes comes. Eventually, they all kind of split off in their own directions. The Essenes decide that getting away from Jerusalem and being in their own isolated communities is the best approach. The Pharisees to remain in there, and the Sadducees start to kind of liberalize as well, even though they're semi-conservative. They're kind of moderates, if you will. Um, but Matthias has a son. His name is Judas, Judas Maccabean. And Judas Maccabees, uh, his nickname is the Hammer. This guy is a military commander, and he takes it upon himself to begin an uprising against Antiochus in that area to regain control for Jews only to control that land. And eventually they are successful. They end up actually getting control of the, the country for a little while, but we're not quite there yet. So he starts this uprising. That's what we get in 32. 33, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. That's the Hasidim. They're the ones who have insight and wisdom to give to the people. Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity and by plunder for many days. He goes to war with them, and he has at them. They're, they're at war. They're persecuted. They're killed. Um, this is really, really bad situation that they're in. That's all outlined in Herodotus. No, not in Herodotus. Herodotus' focus is on the Greco-Persian War. Josephus is going to be where you're going to get the bulk of this. Yeah, um, The wars of the Jews will cover it to an extent, but really uh, antiquities of the Jews deals with it in, in, in bulk. Um, Herodotus only covers, his focus is purely on the interactions between the Persians and the Greeks from about the year 600 about to 440-ish. Yeah. But what's nice in there is that you get some of the Persian history that's behind that. Yeah. Um, but what's cool about that is you have external from the Bible history confirming what we have told us in the Bible. All right. So, um, I'm sorry, let me, I'm going a little too far here. All right, so uh, in uh, 34, now when they fall, they will be granted a little help. Uh, these people are being persecuted, and some of the Hellenistic Jews decide, hey, we, we can go help them. They're our countrymen. Let's go help them. The only problem is that Judas realizes having Hellenists amongst their ranks, not a good idea. And so for, for good or for bad, um, the Maccabees end up executing a, a bunch of the Hellenists within their own ranks to purge their ranks of these people who want to side with Hellenizing Judaism. For good or for bad, it's one of those things of, this is the kind of thing that brings up, are the Maccabees really righteous or are they crazies as well? Which is a question of history. They're part of the prophecy, that's all I can say. Um, and so in the last verse it says, and many will join them in hypocrisy. They're joining though, they're hypocrites, because they want to join in order to help Jews as a nation, but yet they want them Hellenized. So that's the hypocrisy that they're engaged in. 
And so in verse 35, some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time. Let's talk about this purge from the Maccabees, uh, both of those who are persecuted, but also the, those who are hypocrites, because it is still to come at the appointed time, the total purification of the nation, but not yet. Okay. Now, we pause, because a little bit later, we don't get this in this prophecy <laughs> But in 164, Antiochus dies. And that's it for him. Now, I'm going to fast forward behind the scenes a little bit so you can get an idea of what comes next, okay? Come on. Play nice. So the Maccabees end up taking control. The Hasmonean dynasty lasts from about 129. This is a little later than, than our scenario here. About 129, the Hasmoneans get control. And they run it until about 37. Then they get into a little bit of a civil war conflict. Well, who decides, hey, we could go help them break up that civil war? The Romans. And they send a guy that some of you have probably heard of, Pompey. Anybody do any like Julius Caesar? This is one of Caesar's good friends, Pompey. There's Crassus, Pompey, and Caesar. These are three little guys, okay? Pompey is one of them. So Pompey gets sent to kind of break up the civil war and, hey, 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 guys, break it up, break it up. Tell you what, we'll put someone in charge of this country so you guys don't have any more problems. How's that sound? Sound good? In fact, while we're at it, I got this killer idea. I got this uh, Edomite king over here. His name's Herod. I'm going to put him in control. How's that sound? Thanks. We appreciate your cooperation. Have a nice day. And so he leads, leaves Herod the Great, who's an Edomite. If you've heard the phrase Edomian. Yeah, just tad. I, I'm playing the role of Pompey, if you will. Okay. Um, just a heads up. Just as a point of historical fact, this guy ends up getting decapitated and his head gets delivered to Caesar in a basket. So, uh, now Caesar doesn't like this because he's a friend, even though he was opposing him at the time. He was very upset about it. And I've, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, you might know. Um, he, Caesar ends up executing the guys that bring him the head of Pompey, don't they? I think so. Um, he's not happy about it, but he does end up losing his head, literally. Um, so that puts Herod in power from the year 37 forward. Now, here's what's cool. Oh, oh sorry, yes. So the Hasmoneans are, are descended from Maccabees. Maccabees, yes. Okay. Yeah. So here's the cool part. <clears throat> then, during this time period, some no-name Jewish tecton, is what we call them, a craftsman, not necessarily a carpenter, but a craftsman, named Joseph of Nazareth, comes on the scene. And then our story moves forward. Do you see how this fits in now? Okay. None of that comes after 35. Because 36, we're going to jump forward. Any questions so far? Okay. There's a big gap here. Between 35 and 36, big gap. Now, Melissa, you asked last week, does anyone disagree with how they interpreted all this? Up until this point, no. At this point, yes. Because some people like to continue on that this gets into a time period of the Roman Civil War. When Mark Antony and Cleopatra are at war with Octavian, who will eventually become the first emperor of Rome, Augustus Caesar. Um, and, and some of the scenario kind of sounds like it. But the problem is the further into the text you go, the less and less it sounds like the Roman Civil War. And the more it sounds like some king that's coming later. In fact, it's pretty obvious. It's, it's later when you put it in the total context of the passage. So really what's more consistent throughout the passage with the data that's provided is that it is this later coming king. Okay? Although some people will still offer that. So this beast that's still to come, that Daniel has already seen, this horn speaking terrible things, he's still to come. Now bear in mind, this is not the little horn that was on the goat talking boastful things. That was Antiochus. This is the horn that was on the beast that Daniel saw coming out of the sea. Different horn. Okay? I know that's confusing. But just hang with it. So, verse 36. I'm just going to roll through all these because all I can do is give you the data of what's going to happen. In fact, I'm going to give you a summary here in a little bit. Uh, then the king will do as he pleases. Presumably the king of the north at this point because that's who we've been talking about for quite a while. But we're not quite there yet. Then the king will do as he pleases and he will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will speak monstrous things against the god of gods and he will prosper until the indignation is finished. For that which is decreed will be done. So he's going to do what he wants. He will do as he wills. He will magnify himself above every divinity. Something that nobody has done so far, by the way. Really. 
in terms of these nations. I'm sure there's been some wackos that have exalted themselves, but they haven't really accomplished much. Certainly not everything this guy's going to. He will come until the indignation against Israel is complete. In other words, until the judgment against Israel is complete. Until every last bit of their sin has been accounted for through the judgment that God brings on them because of the promise of the covenant, right? So that's verse 36. Verse 37. He will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. Um, he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or women. Uh, this is a, a really weird phrase. Um, many of you may have heard, if you've gotten into the weeds on this, that basically he's showing no regard for the gods, nor does he have any desire for women. Okay. In the context, that's not really how it goes. The Hebrew is a little vague here, but what it appears to be is that he has no regard for the gods of his fathers or the gods which women desire. And what he means by that, theoretically, is that the gods that his father serves, they're the, the war gods, the sovereign providential gods. The ones that the women desire are the fertility gods. The gods that, you know, the, the mother gods, if you will, okay? That makes more sense within the context of the passage than just all of a sudden jumping out because he's going to get right back into this disregard for other gods right after this. So to have this weird thing just pop right in the middle where there's just no desire for women is kind of out of place. So it makes more sense that it's the gods that women give credence to in order to help them with their motherhood, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Verse 38 but instead he will honor, glorify, is the, is the word in the Hebrew, a God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will honor him with gold and silver, costly stones and treasures. So he will regard a God that can give him military strength, basically. He'll pay whatever price is necessary to strengthen and honor this God. The word that is used there is not just honor, it's glorify. It's the same word we use for glorify, kavod or kavad. Uh, if you ever, uh, the... I can't remember the phrase, but basically it glorifies the idea. To make more weighty and more magnificent in the eyes of others is basically the idea. And, of course, could this be the enemy? Could this be Satan? I would argue that it is the God of this world that's giving him this strength and power. A God whom his fathers did not know. Um, makes sense, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Verse 39 and stop me if I'm trucking through this too fast. But uh, he will take action against the strongest of fortresses with the help of a foreign god or a strange god is the term that's used here. Um, which gives me, again, another little bit of credence that I think this is probably Satan to whom it's referring. Satan, by the way, Satan's not a name. It's a title. It means the, the uh, opposer or the enemy. Um, but it's a strange god that he's referring to here. Um, he will give great honor to those who acknowledge him and will cause them to rule over the many and will parcel out land for a price. So basically what's happening is he'll assault the strongholds of other nations. He will serve a strange or foreign god, if you will, foreign in the sense of strange. And whoever gives regard to him will be rewarded by him with land. He'll honor them. But whoever gives deference to him will be honored. Those who don't will face his wrath, basically. Verse 40. At the end time, the king of the south, presumably where? Based on context. Egypt, okay. The king of the south will engage with him, and the king of the north will storm against him. Now, this is the first time we get this mention of king of the north. Some people think it's now three kings being mentioned here. The king that we've been talking about, the king of the north, and king of the south coming against him. Okay. My argument is going to be that he's from the north, because what we find out from other passages in Scripture is this guy eventually will base himself out of Babylon which is the kingdom of the north. And in the context, it makes more sense that he's the king of the north that they're talking about. So the king of the south comes, but the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and many ships. And he will enter uh, countries or lands, overflow them, and pass through them. So which king is it? Is it the south is obviously Egypt-ish. Please bear in mind, Egyptians nowadays are not ethnically Egyptian. They're Arab. Okay, uh, So... We're not really sure what this means in terms of Egypt, whether we're talking about ethnic group or we're talking about just the region. Uh, the north is kind of Babylon-ish. Again, there's, they're Arabs. These are, uh, this is where Iraq is. Um, but he's going to be based there. And, of course, then there's the beast. Or, again, like I would suggest, the south is Egypt, the north is the beast that we've been talking about. So the king of the north, the beast, will come against the king of the south, who's in Egypt. And I know I'm going fast through this, but hang tight. So verse 41 through 43, he will also enter the beautiful land, or, or Israel, and many uh, will be thrown down. It says many countries will fall, but really the, the imagery is being thrown down. 
But these will be rescued out of his hands, Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. Why? Why did these three escape? Who's the father of Edom? Esau. Who's the father of Moab and Ammon? Lot. Both men who were blessed by the Lord because of their associations with the covenant family. He doesn't want to touch them. He's made promises to these nations in the past that he's not going to touch them. That he will bless them despite their disobedience because they are associated with the covenant people. So, again, symbolic or regional. Edom is kind of to the southeast of Israel, Moab, Ammon. These were Jordan, Iraq areas. I don't know. Whatever that's going to look like. Uh, but Egypt's not going to escape. We find out in verse uh, 42, Then he will stretch out his hand uh, against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. And then in verse 43, But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians will follow at his heels. They will be destroyed as well. Uh, the Cushites, we talked about when we did our Isaiah study, they're to the south of Egypt, and then Libya is to the west. Uh, you can look on a modern map and see that, the Ethiopians and Libyans. 44 and 45, last two verses. But reports from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with many, with, excuse me, with great wrath to uh, destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch the tents of his royal palace or royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. So reports are coming from the north and east. Where? I don't know. You know, lots of people like to throw nations on this, like it's China and all these. Okay, that's great. That's newspaper eschatology, but okay, whatever. Um, somehow those reports are coming from the north and the east. They're coming against him in a renewed effort to attack him. He goes to make war with them. He, make, he moves his palace from Babylonish over to Jerusalem to make his rule there because eventually what we'll find out is he'll exalt himself in the temple of the Lord. And we find out from other texts. Um, but he'll come to his end and no one's going to help him including his God. He gets abandoned. And we see this in Revelation because he gets cast into the lake of fire. So that's the end of him. All is chaos. And in the end, this guy who's wreaked havoc across the world, no one's going to help him. At this point, who would want to help him? Okay. Dr. Donald Campbell, former president of DTS Summer, which I didn't know, he died two weeks ago. I was very sad to hear that. Uh, he's one of the former presidents of DTS. He summarized it this way, and I thought this was, this was just brilliant. Um, and you can see the verses here. He will act in self-will. He will exalt himself and will magnify himself above every god. He will blaspheme the true god. He will succeed for a limited period of time and will be an irreligious person. He will also, I'm sorry with all the spaces, I didn't realize they were all there, place confidence in military might. His military might will be challenged. And he will be initially victorious in battle. However, he will face renewed conflict and will establish his headquarters in Jerusalem and will finally come to an end. There you go. 36 to 45. Dare I ask? The reality is that, again, please don't get into newspaper eschatology, newspaper end time stuff, I w because you'll be wrong every time. Lord bless Hal Lindsey. Um... The number of times he has been absolutely positively wrong because he's playing newspaper prophecy, it's not okay. We don't know how this is going to play out, and until it does, we're not going to be able to look and say, oh, well, obviously. <laughs> the point is there's a plan, right? There's a plan in motion. Now, the great thing about this is we've seen all this happen, and yet there's still more to come. There's still a plan in motion. The plan has not stopped. It, you know, a lot of you, okay, Jesus came, now we're all just sitting around. Is he coming back? There's things to be done. The plan is still in motion. He's given us a mission and a plan as we go forward. And so that's why you should care. Because we're still part of this plan. The plan is still moving forward. And I want to give you guys a, a little bit of a tidbit here. Uh, any of you guys have done methodical Bible study, you know, you do observation, interpretation, correlation, application, and you type in your little formula in the passage and outspits your application, basically. You know, that's all well and good. And that's what we teach at CDI, observation, interpretation, correlation. Yeah, you should have heard of this stuff before. Um, but I'm going to argue for instead of application is the word, is response. Because application has this idea of I've got to take action. I've got to have this smart goal, right? 
short term measured I can't remember all of them um, you gotta have a smart goal I gotta do you know I gotta have tangible things I gotta take action now but sometimes the reality is that response to scripture response to the God of scripture is a change of mind or a change of heart that isn't necessarily going to immediately act now in this circumstance but will set you up for later response of action later because frankly sometimes the reality is the purpose of this passage Daniel 10 through 12 is to encourage in light of what appears to be a halt in God's plan for Daniel it's there to encourage it's there to encourage Israel it's there to encourage us and let's be honest sometimes we just need to be encouraged okay so be encouraged let this reassure you that you are still part of the Lord's plan to redeem and restore his creation to his glory remember that's the end of all things is his glory and you're still part of that plan and I'm really, I love this month because you have an opportunity to talk with people who are helping to make this a, a reality in the nations. That you can be part of supporting them, and, and not just financially, but supporting them in so many different ways as they go out and make the name of the Lord known. But you're also part of that plan as you go out into the communities and make that plan known to others. The gospel of the kingdom is that God is restoring his kingdom. He is redeeming and restoring his world. So this should be an encouragement that you need to go out and be faithful to the part you play in this story. We're not done yet. Uh, it's, I'm always reminded of this little picture. There's a little bitty, i got to be a toddler in a tuxedo. And he's going like this. And the meme for teacher says, Bell doesn't dismiss you. I dismiss you. You know, basically, we're not done yet. Okay? You're not done yet. Don't check out. We have a plan. There's a plan in motion, and you are part of it. If you call Christ your Lord, you are an ambassador for the Lord to make him known. So be encouraged to do so. Questions? Okay. If you have any questions you'd like to talk about afterwards, I got a bit of time. Uh, well, we got to do that chapter. Well, and, and just a heads up, we are going to do chapter twelve next week, Lord willing. After that, we're actually going to do a wrap up. We've never done that before, but we're going to start doing that, doing a wrap up to because it's been months that we've been going over this. We want to give you kind of the high altitude over it again. Say, here's what we've done. Okay, here's where we've been, and then after that, we will, uh, Lord willing, we're looking at First Peter uh, for the spring. So. Uh, which just depends upon. We've got to look at our schedule again, but uh, that's the plan right now. So, All right, well, I'll be here for a bit if you want to talk, um, but let's uh, pray and we will be dismissed. And please go out and talk to the people out in the foyer. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would, uh, again, help us to be encouraged by your spirit, that your plan is still in motion, that you're still working, and that you've still got us as part of your plan to make you known, to be ambassadors for your kingdom, to make you known. And we pray that you give us encouragement and strength edify us and help us continue to be equipped to make your name known and bring you glory pray be with our brothers and sisters who are sick pray that you would heal them and make them whole and strong and pray that you bless us all as we go out to serve them as well and we pray this in the name of jesus Amen.